Good, good afternoon to everyone joining from Europe. Good morning to everyone from North America, US, Canada. Where all do we would love to see where people are calling in from if you want to put a quick note in the chat pane, but we are we're thrilled to be doing another quote unquote European edition of our webinar series. For those of you, this is your first time. My name is Mark Stoddard. I run sales and marketing here at Client Success. I've kind of been the, the shepherd on all of these and really, really had a, had a great time doing them. Um, we also have Dave Blake, CEO of Client Success, and of course, our guest today, Rob Dollywall from Crane Ventures. Rob, Dave, can you guys hear us okay? Loud and clear. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, right, cool. good to be here. Very good. Looks like we've got an international audience. We've got Bangalore, we've got Singapore, we've got Boston, we have Oxford, Israel. We are all over the awesome. place. Dayton, Ohio. This is cool to see. Uh, really good. <coughs> um, well, cool. So um, just a few, kind. Of, I'll just kind of run through a few slides here at the top. So um, a lot of you have been on other sessions in the webinar series. A lot of you, this might be your first time. So just to kind of give you a, a quick kind of run through, we've been running these webinars every week for the last few months. We've had a ton of influencers, really cool you know, operators, thought leaders. And so there's just been an enormous amount of really great customer success content. And we're right in the middle of kind of the June, July series here you can see last week we had folks like mark roberts Pr prior to that we had another really great european leader matt Moskowski from sap um really just interesting thoughts whether it's kind of more like how to run your customer success team best practices um, we even had some sessions recently on how to you know manage your mental health in a customer success role so some really important stuff so would love for everyone if you want to go back and view previous sessions they're easy to find clientsuccess.com slash webinars um, and you know we'll, we'll have all the slides there after we're done with Rob today we'll we'll post the recording we'll post the slides there and yeah, so I think before, I think Dave, you wanted to, to jump in and share a few things. How about, uh, how about you share what you were thinking about? Yeah, hey, welcome everybody. We're so grateful that you could join us from all over the world. Uh, it's, it's always great to see the, the, the customer success community come together like this. And we're so grateful you would take some time out of your day to, uh, to join us. Uh, I'm excited to, to hear Rob today. I'll share a little bit more about him in one minute. But uh, let me share a couple of quick thoughts. And Mark, I don't know if we have slides today or not, but um, the- Yeah, we do. A uh, few things. We've been doing a campaign uh, around, uh, um, a around a survey that we're, we're promoting out there. We're doing the 2020 State of Customer Success Survey. And so we really, the more we can have participate in this survey, the better. We, uh, so we wanna, first of all, encourage you all to go and take the survey um, and share your feedback about you and your company and, and what, what you do as a CSM. And we look forward to in the coming weeks and months to, to share the insights back to the community that we think will be very valuable to each of you. So Mark will post the uh, link. Looks like he's put that in the, in the um, chat, the chat pod. If you would take just 10 minutes to, to complete that survey, that would be really helpful. The second thing is, um, uh, we've been doing a campaign throughout this whole COVID crisis called Help One Hire One, uh, and we are, are encouraging everybody to just find one person that you can help get a job. I'm really excited today to uh, to uh, let you know that we've seen the fruits of this come come uh, come about. We've we've uh, recently heard of several people who have been helped by others who are getting jobs. It feels like that it's starting to open up a little bit. And so if you're in a position to help anybody, review their resume, make an introduction, point them to a job opening, please do so. And if you're in a position to hire anybody, if you're, your company's hiring, please do so. Hire one, hire two, hire more than you, that, than you were hoping, just to get our, our friends in the customer success community uh, back, into, uh, back to work. Uh, and so we, we're, we're excited to hear that the results of this small, um, grassroots efforts is working and we encourage you to continue to do that uh, and may, maybe mark if you want to go back to the first one if you haven't heard of, of client success or a customer success platform 
we we help uh, customer success uh, managers and leaders and companies drive a culture of customer success. And we our platform is there to help from new to renew. So everything from onboarding through the renewal and driving uh, actionable insights throughout your company to help you manage and, and grow and accelerate growth with your customer base. So we're excited that you join us. Um, we're here to help. If there's anything we can do, please let us know. We're, we're always happy to, to be a resource for you as a solution provider or as friends in the community. And now with that, I just, I'm excited to hear Rob today. Uh, Rob and I, Rob, I think we met in Waterloo Station. Is that right? Indeed, yes, that's right. That's right. My last yeah. trip to London, we were able to touch base. And after uh, several uh, years of, of watching Rob from a distance and admiring his thought leadership and uh, all that he's contributed to this space, we were able to meet uh, last time I was in London, and we're grateful to have him today. I can't think of somebody who has more experience in customer success. And so you're gonna, it's gonna be a treat for you to hear from him today. Um, and uh, now he, he has a perspective from the other side of the table uh, working for a venture firm. So we're excited, Rob, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And, and I look forward to hearing uh, everything you have to say today. Lovely, thank you so much, Dave. And hopefully it won't be too long thank before you. we can't meet again in person. That's right, I look forward to yeah, it. That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Well, cool. Um, I know, I know, Rob, you've got slides to share. So maybe what I'll do sure. is I'll stop sharing on my side. Lovely. Right, I'll uh, turn, the, turn the controls over to you. And just so everybody you. knows, I think, Rob, you said you've got probably about 15, 20 ish minutes of content slides to share. And so if you have questions, we'll probably save most of the questions in the Q&A a little bit toward, toward the end of that. So as you do have questions, they'll feel free to pop them in the chat pane, pop them in the Q&A. Um, I'll just kind of keep an eye on all of them, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll turn things over to to you, Lovely. Rob, and go from there. Thank you so much, Mark. And you can see the screen, okay, there? Yeah, I can see your screen. Yep. Lovely, great. So I'm just going to share the presentation. Well, thanks again, Mark, for uh, and Dave for inviting me along today, and thanks to everybody for for joining the session. I, I really appreciate it. So, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, my name is Rav. Uh, we're in a very unusual macroeconomic situation at the moment, of course, with the pandemic and lockdowns. Uh, we're in a situation where new sales are likely to be very slow or, or in some cases even non-existent for at least the remainder of the year. And in my current uh, role as uh, an investor, what CEOs are telling me and founders are telling me is that existing customers are really just way more important now, and much higher up on their radar than they have ever been before. Uh, but what's really clear is that a lot of these leaders are still not actually have a good understanding of what CS is and what the CS team does and the value that it adds. And so when Mark and Dave approached me about doing a session, one thought, the thing we thought would be really useful would be um, digging into why now is really the perfect time uh, to promote the importance of CS internally uh, at your company. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next 15 minutes or so. So as Mark and Dave mentioned, my name is uh, Rav Dhaliwal. I like to describe myself as a recovering software executive. Uh, I spent about the last 20 years or so working in various uh, enterprise software companies in a number of roles, but broadly all oriented towards working with, with customers. Um, I currently run uh, an advisory business, which is specifically focused at working with uh, venture capital and growth equity firms. And as part of my work, I am a partner at uh, Crane Venture Partners. Uh, for anyone who would like to follow along or connect on, on LinkedIn, uh, feel free, uh, feel welcome to do so. So I've been really lucky to work for a couple of uh, sort of very large, well-known global brands. I'm sure you recognize these logos here. But for the last 12 years, my experience has really been <clears throat> uh, very, very lucky of being very early in, a, in some very hyper growth uh, startups. And it's really the experience of building and driving and, uh, and inculcating a, a customer success culture in these early companies that I really want to share with you on the webinar today. So the first thing that I'd like to share is that um, to get that sort of seat at the table, and by seat at the table, what we're really talking about is getting the mind share that you need and the influence you need to help everybody understand why CS is such a vital part of the health of not only your customers, but of your company. The first step in actually getting that seat at the table or keeping it if you have it, is to make sure that you're defining customer success at your, com at your company. 
And what I mean by that is that one of the challenges with CS and a, and a lot of the reasons why leaders and other people have very preconceived notions about it is there doesn't seem to be one catch-all definition. Uh, and so this is a really good opportunity for you as CS practitioners and leaders uh, to put, put aside the fact that CS means different things at different companies and define it for your own company before actually someone defines it for you. So one of the things as a starting point that I think is quite useful is to actually have a baseline definition of the CS profession. And of all the various iterations I've seen, I really like this one, which is customer success is a function or a collection of functions whose, whose focus is about building value. And by value, what we're talking about is material bottom line value. I have helped the customer do something faster, quicker, cheaper, or, 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 or help them to generate more revenue. But it's about building that value faster than the customer could have done on their own. So in other words, CS is an accelerant. Uh, and because what we're trying to do is get them to see value, bottom line value from our solution, so that our company uh, sees value from its bottom line, because we want to keep and grow that customer forever, because acquiring customers and especially losing them is a very expensive proposition. So as a baseline definition, this is, a, a, I think, quite a useful starting point. But the key thing and the thing that's missing here is you have to be able to prove that you can do all of this. And I think this is where sometimes CS teams struggle when they're asked to articulate internally or share with what they do. It's not, it's not uncommon to share the activities that you do rather than the actual value that you're adding to both your customer and your own company's bottom line. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the importance of proving what you do a bit later. Now, if you don't have a, a, a definition or a succinct definition or elevator pitch, as I like to call it for CS at your company, or you're working on one, then in the interim, simply stating what your mission is uh, resonates very, very well with executive teams and leaders. And the mission of any good success team is this, it's to create the conditions for the next and subsequent sales with your existing customers. And this is really powerful because it helps to get over the idea that really you're in a continuous sales motion. There is no such thing as sales and post sales in a SaaS business, in my opinion. There's the first sale, the next sale, and subsequent sales. And, and customer success is actually the engine that is creating the condition for all of those subsequent sales. So here's an example of, uh, from a company that I've been working with recently um, of what I think a good, succinct definition looks like. Uh, they define themselves internally as saying, well, what we do is we apply very deep product and digital change expertise to quickly grow net revenue retention. So it hits on a couple of the key themes there. What's the value that this team is adding? They're adding deep product skills and digital change management skills. That's the value, the accelerant they're adding. That results in quicker uh, realization of value. And they've also included a baseline metric of the company, of their company that they are actually trying to influence. So this is, a, again, a nice succinct example. It can be quite, uh, a, quite a lot of work to come up with something that's succinct, but I wanted to share this with you as a, a good example of what good looks like. Now, let's say that you, uh, CS is not either completely understood at your company or it's maybe understood in different ways. Uh, what I wanted to do was share some tips with you from both my experience, having been through some fast growing companies, but also from a whole host of other startup leaders uh, of some useful questions to ask yourself to um, make sure that you are in the best possible position to get that seat at the table, get that mind share and influence, get the organization thinking about long-term customer value. So the first question to ask yourself is, do you have that elevator pitch for your team? So we've obviously just talked about that. And when I talk about the internal change management effort towards the end of the, the session today, you'll understand why the elevator pitch is so important. Having that succinct pitch that's very much focused on that value that you're adding both to the customer and to your own business is super important in helping to kind of uh, raise awareness of what you do, but also to actually change behaviors and orient them around long-term customer value. Do you have a reputation as being the everything department? It's not uncommon, especially in an early growing business, for the CS team to be doing all sorts of stuff and owning all sorts of stuff because it doesn't fit anywhere else. And the classic sign of that is that you're a CS team, but you're also doing support tickets. Well, support or customer experience is a whole other function. So if you find that actually 
you have uh, you're you're owning a whole load of things because they don't fit somewhere else. It makes it very very hard to have that succinct elevator pitch, which means it's very hard to get that mind share and that seat at the table. So it might be time to start unbundling some of those things and uh, functions and activities that you aren't really aligned to your core focus as a team uh, and really double down on that, on that value that you add. Do you have a material number you are carrying? Now, this doesn't necessarily always mean you have a revenue target, although that is actually an ideal state to get to. And that's, but do you actually affect metrics that are really materially important to your company at the time? So in the early stages, especially in an early stage startup, where you may not even have product market fit yet, what a CS team can really add a lot of value to is, is actually with the product team and helping them to understand what to build in order to drive fast time to value for customers. So it's not uncommon in an early stage company for time to value to be a key company metric. So aligning to that from a CS perspective makes a lot of sense. In some later stage companies where you have good product market fit and you start to build and crank up that inbound and outbound sales engine, this is a time where you may, usage may become a, a very key indicator of the company's health and something that the board and the leadership care about. So actually being aligned to an active usage number or an active usage target would, could potentially make a lot of sense. And then ultimately, as you have developed that product market fit and your go, to mo your go to market motion is maturing, holding a revenue number, something like net revenue retention, where you are showing not only how much revenue you're retaining, but how much you're growing the existing customer base by, is a really important metric for a company. And if you can be aligned and targeted to that, it does buy you a lot of influence and a lot of seat at the table. The other question is that, do you have all the necessary data and signals available to you to actually be able to correlate all the good work that you're doing with the bottom line impact that you're having for the company? And this can be quite challenging for, for CS teams because data lives in lots of different places, but it is definitely worth spending some time and effort to be able to coordinate that, correlate it, whether it's with another tool or through manual effort, so you can actually show quantitatively how the work you're doing is impacting those metrics that the company really cares about. And in my experience as well, this is also very useful for you, especially for success leaders, in showing you the things that you should stop doing. Uh, there are some activities that you may do on a regular basis, but they don't help to move the needle either for the customer or for your own business. So if you have good data and signals and you're tracking them, uh, you, you can actually be really, really effective about where you use your time and resource. One of the key things to ask yourself is, do you have integration into the sales pipeline? So this is a, a lot more than just visibility of the sales pipeline. It's active involvement in key deals at the right stages before they close. And this is really, really important from an alignment perspective, because what you want to be able to do is to show that, A, you're having an impact in, uh, and CS is being used as a lever to help close deals when it's appropriate but also that you are off to the best possible start and the quickest possible start helping the customer see value because you were introduced to them before the deal actually closed. Uh, too often, what happens is you get a hard handover. You get an email or maybe a ticket that says, this customer's closed, we're gonna introduce you to them. And it's not uncommon for CS to have to resell the whole solution or do a whole lot of work to engage the customer. Uh, and that's a bad experience both for you and for your own company. And for the, as well as the customer, and it can really, really help to um, uh, make it harder to show that the positive impact that you're having. So let's say you have answers to some or, or hopefully all of these eventually. Um, it's then really important to focus on the internal change management. And when I talk about change management, change management is the study and practice of changing behaviors. And really what we want to do is change uh, or influence the internal behavior to be thinking about some key things, long-term customer value, the fact that we're in a continuous sales motion. Uh, and so uh, often CS teams are so busy delivering change to their customers, they either forget or don't have time to do the change management internally. So what I'm gonna close uh, the, the slides uh, portion of our, our webinar today is talk about a few tips on how to actually structure and manage the internal change management aspect of uh, getting CS uh, a seat at the table. So the first thing is really awareness. And this is about using all the internal vehicles that are open to you to promote the work 
CS does. And this is where having that uh, elevator pitch, that succinct mission, showing how you're adding to the bottom line becomes really important. And some of the vehicles that people use very effectively are always having a regular slot at the company or hands, uh, uh, either being at keyboard meetings or making sure the board pack contains data and updates on the CS is part of the business and any other internal events where you can actually promote and drive more knowledge and awareness of what it is that you do. Coupled with awareness is actually proactively creating a desire for other parts of the business to work with you. Some of the key ones are obviously sales, the product team and marketing. And this is about the CS practitioners and leadership actively educating uh, these other parts of the business and showing them how they can help those departments hit their goals and their metrics with the work that they're doing and to create formal and informal alliances and formal and informal uh, alignments around communications. So there is this desire to work together towards uh, common goals. The other area for managing the internal change is having the knowledge and sharing the knowledge of that bottom line impact you're having. So that's really being on top of your numbers, having the data and being able to share that back through uh, all of the other channels that you have. So whether it's net revenue retention or active usage in terms of incremental ARR, or maybe you're currently tasked on sentiment because that's what the overall, the board wants you to focus on. Having that data, being able to show how that's trending over time and having the vehicle to report that back is really important to manage that internal change. And finally, reinforcing all of this. So it's no point just doing this once, uh, but it's because the business is constantly changing and growing. You want to continually drive awareness, continually proactively build that desire, continually share that knowledge, uh, keep those regular slots at the board meetings and the all hands, keep consistent data and reporting, and even consider having and I've seen many companies do this, uh, build a CS comms plan. So an internal comms plan for the different channels, messages and people that you want to share across the business uh, to keep that uh, uh, cycle going of uh, helping people to understand the value that you are adding. And you want to adapt this because the business will be constantly changing as well. So your approach, your awareness, your metrics, they'll all change. So again, you want to change your plan in accordance with where you are as a company. So in summary, uh, some tips on getting that seat at the table and keeping it are, you know, make sure that you've got a nice crisp definition of CS, what customer success means at your company, create that elevator pitch, orient that pitch around value, the value that you add to the customer, the skills that you're adding, the techniques, but the value that you're adding to your own bottom line. Continually share that, especially the bottom line impact. It's really important for the business to understand what numbers you are helping to move and have a plan, uh, a very concrete plan to manage that internal change. We talked about a very high level set of steps uh, that can be applied to a simple plan and keep reinforcing that plan and, and adapting it as and when your business changes. So with that, I just want to thank you all for your kind attention. And I think we are going to move to questions from uh, the chat. So yeah, exactly. Mark. So Back no, to that you. was really good. Really appreciate it, Rob. That was really good content. And like you say, we're going to, we're going to move to, to Q and a, we've got, you know, several questions that are in there right now. I've got a few questions myself. Sure. Um, and I suspect that, you know, the, the questions will be wide ranging because, you know, you, you hit on so many like key areas. You talked about like this elevator pitch concept. You talked about this concept of, you know, owning, you know, stepping up and like owning a number. And I, and I know we've got several questions around owning a number, mm. but I, you, you're the first person that has brought up this idea of an elevator pitch for customer success. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I think that's a really cool concept. Like for, for you, like typically do you see, you know, companies developing, like do you see the CS org kind of developing that elevator pitch themselves or are they bringing in partners from other parts of the organization? If so, who do you tend to see them leaning on? Like unpack. A little oh, bit what a great question. The, yeah. The later pitch side. Well, the, the simple answer to that is, and it sounds a little bit trite, but the best people to lean on in order to understand the value you're adding are your customers. So actually soliciting from them, like what is it that we're bringing to the table that really helps it? So, um, I can give you an example from my time at Slack. I was the first UK employee. I was the first success hire uh, at a time where the company was adding 5% new users week on week. 
And, and there's me telling CEO Stuart Butterfield, you have a huge problem with adoption. Right? How do you think that message is going to go? In fact, the day I gave him that message, I was in San Francisco and they had just hit a million connected users at the same time. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm about to tell him he needs a CS function because adoption is a problem. But what it occurred to me was, and I'd been a user of the tool, and this is how I framed it for, for Stuart. I said, you actually don't have a technology problem. You have a change management problem. You're trying to change the behavior of how people work. So you need a function that does that. And that's what I propose CS at Slack should be. It should be a change management function. And he said, okay, that makes sense. Prove it to me. And that's the organization I went out and built. Uh, now, that was based on a lot of my experience talking to a lot of uh, people who had been in collaboration, talking to Slack customers as well. But if you're in an organization right now and you're busy doing lots of stuff, if you really want to try and succinctly put down the value that you're adding, go talk to your customers. And if they say, well, actually, the value that you're adding is you're helping to me to translate these very complex business problems into how uh, to use the product, there you go. That's the beginning of your pitch. Really, what I'm doing is I am bringing consultative skills to model business processes. Yes. You know, if, if the customer says to you, well, the way you're really helping us, Mark, in, in uh, seeing value and helping our business is you have such deep domain and technical expertise that we can get this thing up and going and integrated quicker than we could have ourselves. There you go. That's the value that you're at. So I think that's, prob that's probably the approach that I would take um, beyond just talking about sort of key activities that you do. Yeah, I think that could be a, a session in and of itself is understanding like different models. And, you know, mm -hmm. so, so there's there's certain some companies that, you know, are kind of like, I help you do what you already do a little bit better. And so it yeah. doesn't need a, a heavy change management aspect to it. But like your example of Slack yeah. and other things where it's like it's there really is kind of a train a change management piece. So you do need people to get involved and help there. Yeah, so broadly, and, and I've, I'm actually writing a medium piece about this at the moment, and I'll be happy to share it with you guys when it's done, is yeah. broadly, there's kind of three buckets to think about products. There are products where in order for a customer to see value, you have to bring a lot of technical expertise. You know, it might be a product for developers. It might be middleware. So that's one type of CS organization. There's another type of organization where actually the technology lift is really low. There's really, it's freemium. The customer just uses it themselves. But what we're doing is, exactly. But there's a huge amount of behavior change involved for, to get them to use it. So that's, that's more of a, a change management style CS organization. And then there's a third, which is actually, uh, the way that customer gets value from our product is they're gonna model and improve certain processes they already have in our product. So Salesforce is a good example. Zendesk is a good example, right? You guys are a good example, client success, right? I have a, a process that's maybe manual, not optimal, and I need to use your product to in the best possible way. Well, the value that you're bringing there is consultative skill. Yeah. You're actually sort of saying, I'm understanding your process and your business problem, and I have such good product knowledge, I'm showing you the best way to translate that into the product. Sure. So thinking about pro what bucket your product is in can be a very useful place to start in doing that definition. Yeah, for sure. So mm -hmm. l l let's jump into some Manon asks a question, kind of going back to, I think he popped this question in when we were talking more about the, the owning of a number. And this is, mm -hmm. this is a hot topic. I mean, I think you talk sure. to 10 people, you get kind of different sides of this one. So I'm interested to see your, your thoughts here. He says, as a CSM, you know, you don't want to solely fo focus on adding value via money. Um, so what data do you measure that allows you to create value for your customers? So it's like, it, yeah, is it just like trying to understand like how you impact their bottom line? Are there other metrics? So it might be a little bit contextual based on the business, but what are your, what are your, and that's all, uh, to understand the question a bit more, that's how do we prove the value we're adding to the customer as opposed to internal? So, yeah. Yeah. I think so. if, it, if it's the customer if not, and the, if, we're, if we're thinking about that wrong, clarify yeah. for me in the chat pane, but yeah. So I think there's two parts of this. One, if we look at the internal part is, uh, there is, um, uh, I think there is a philosophical challenge sometimes in a lot of CS practitioners and leaders, which is if I have a number, I'm a salesperson and sales is bad. Right. And sales is not bad because if there's no sales, none of us need to be here. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the better way to think about it is actually I'm in a SaaS company. It's a subscription company. I'm in a continual sales motion. So my AE colleagues, they have a short, they have a leading metric, which is ACV. And I have a, I have a lagging metric, which is ARR. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just realized 12 months later. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
on the customer side, value is really defined by what, uh, uh, this sounds very pithy, but whoever signs the check at the customer end is likely the person who's going to define what they see as value. And so that goes back to having that softer handover, actually understanding the customer's goals before they have closed so that you can keep reaffirming to you, is this your target? Is this your goal? Is this what you need to see in order to demonstrate value? And that will vary a great deal depending on the type of solution. Uh, in some solutions, adoption does not correlate to value at all because it's middleware. No one logs into it. No one uses it. But maybe through maybe throughput of data does. So the more data you put through it, the more value that you add. So it's going to be a little bit to do with the with, with the with the product and solution, but actually mostly to do with uh, the reason the customer bought it and what they subscribe subscribe as value to the solution, what they believe success looks like. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So so, so next, Kusbu has an interesting question on like collaboration with other teams, her specifically on products. So. Mm -hmm. um, she says, can you, can you touch on if and how a CS team can contribute towards developing a product, a robust product roadmap? Um, you know, in a lot of cases, CS is the, is the one who's talking to customers the most, who's engaging with mm. them, consulting with them. Um, what's your advice on kind of the collaboration between how customer success can work with product to really influence how the, how, how the roadmap goes? Yeah, that's a great question, a co very common question. And I would say there's two parts to that. From a CS engaging with customers regarding product, I think the best advice I've ever heard is listen, empathize, but promise nothing. Uh, so I think that's the first thing. Yeah. But on the internal side, uh, I think one very good tactical thing that CS practitioners can do is not bring feature requests to products. Bring them problem statements. Interesting. That, Give us a few examples of that. So here's an example. As a CSM, I might come to my product team and go, you know what, the customers all need an audit feature, right? That's what they need. You need to build us an audit feature. And product people hate that. They hate to be told what to build. Uh, and they go, well, you know, we'll think about it. We've got these other priorities. Thank you, blah, blah, blah. If you come to them and say, we've spoken to 15 customers, and what's happening is every month, one person from their team has to spend 15 hours going through each record and pulling out the ones with personally identifiable information, because if they don't do that, they'll lose their financial licensing and they'll go out of business. That's a problem statement, right? What you've done there is actually given them the same bit of information, but not the solution. Because the product person will go, ah, actually that's a business problem we have to think about how we deal with in our product. And they may already be thinking about it in the context of some other feature that does the same thing, but isn't an audit feature. Or they may conclude, we need an audit feature. So actually training your teams on presenting uh, problem statements rather than feature requests is actually, I think, uh, my experience has been a very good way to get much more alignment and much more buy-in uh, from the product team. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, no, I think I, that, that is, I, I think I've tried to say it that way a half a dozen times, but you just made it far more clear for me. So that makes, it makes an oh, idea. I'm glad it's been helpful. Yeah. Cool. Um, so Guy asks a specific question kind of, for, to, to their business model. And so there's, you know, th there's a lot of kind of traditional SaaS recurring revenue businesses. And it sounds like in his case, they are a pay per use model. So, so he asks, um, you know, what are the right CS metrics or customer success metrics to focus on in a pay per use model? Mm. Um, how do you measure your team churn? I mean, obviously, you know, th th there's probably different metrics that you would track here for a uh, a pay per use, which I suspect maybe like Slack was probably in a pay per yeah. use model. It's a, a yeah, it's a maybe consumption model. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, what, are, yeah. what are some of the key metrics that you track? Well, I can give you, uh, I can give you an even bigger challenge. So Slack was not only a consumption model; it was what's called a fair billing model, which where if you went inactive, we pro rata credited you back the money for for two yeah. weeks of inactivity. So you can imagine here in Europe, when the whole of Scandinavia goes on vacation, that hit my target really hard for like the <laughs> for Q3, right? Yeah, so, um, so if in, a, in a consumption model, what you really, I think, want to be doing is looking at incremental use quarter on quarter. So what you, uh, what you want to be doing is working with your ops teams on, I mean, the sales ops teams that are setting the targets to actually say, well, our forecast is anticipating this level of uh, deal closure in the quarter. Uh, this is the kind of historical consumption rate we are able to drive off this, this subset of customers, set our target 
to you know quarter on quarter for growth in that consumption target so as a cs team really what you want to be doing is measuring two things how quickly can we get the customer to the consumption target they purchase for so you know if they purchase for an x volume of consumption how quickly can we get them to that stage because if you optimize for that that gives you a lot longer in the quarter to work with them to actually consume more and then you can you don't want them coming back at the end of the quarter saying i only use like 10 percent of this exactly quarter. so that's yeah. where you get to a fair if you have a fair billing a fair billing or a true up, or a true up every quarter right so Got so it. yeah you would want to probably optimize for again this is where not having a hard handover would help get introduced to the customer is it uh you know middle of the sales cycle start building a relationship with them start planning with them so you can hit the consumption target you know, the, the day the deal closes, you can keep moving yep. forward. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. Well, um, hopefully that helps, Guy. If there's any other questions, follow up on that. Um, mm -hmm. Brian asks, uh, I, I think this this question's interesting. So he's, so he's pulling a few different things together. So he says, to blend some of your concepts. So when dealing with both data and bottom line value, you know, if someone owns a subset of data, like revenue, but you, meaning customer success, you own the transactional data, how would you recommend going about blending the two or gaining real-time access to that financial data? Um, mm. What are your thoughts there? That's a, that's well, that's a tough, well, that seems, sounds to be much more like a tooling challenge rather than anything else, which is, uh, and it goes back to what I spoke about that often data that you need is in different pockets in different systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there's one or two aspects of that. You could, I'm a very big fan of when a CS team gets to a certain size in the same way sales has a sales ops person, have a CS ops person, and their mission in life is to work with sales ops to actually work on this data. If the uh, access is restricted for tooling reasons, and that's something that you would want to be working with your leadership through to see what the technical solution to that is, right? So is it Tableau or is it, uh, you know, any of these myriad, Power BI, any of these myriad of tools where, you know, we can get a view on that. So. Um, I, I would be very uh, surprised if, uh, if it was a non-technical reason, i.e. we don't want to share this with anyone internally, because if you need it to, if you need it to be effective in your job, it's, uh, there's a lot of value in sharing it. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, you bring up this concept of customer success ops. I mean, I think you know, everyone's used to having a sales ops team for the last, mm -hmm. let's call it 10 to 15 years. The mm -hmm. idea of a customer success ops um, function, I think you... I, w the way I saw it is you had you had sales ops being built out and then a lot of companies you had kind of a marketing ops function mm -hmm. and now you're starting to see kind of a customer success ops function um, and so we could again probably do a whole other section on you know how to how to go about that but for you like what are if you're thinking about kind of that customer success ops side or in you know Brian's case it sounds like maybe he needs more of a CS ops function Mm -hmm. What would be just high level? What's one or two things you would think about if you were to say, okay, we're we're going to experiment with a with a CS ops function? You know, what what goals would I have them work toward? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? So I think some of the things that I'd be really interested in. That's funny. D oh. David actually just asked the same question as. I oh, there you go. So. Fantastic. Great minds. Great minds. Uh, so I think some of the things I'd be really. Uh, looking for them to help me tease out the data is what's the effectiveness of the work that we're actually doing so if we are training customers can you correlate training to some metric outcome so in other words more users are signing up to the system or there's more feature consumption or we're driving more if it's consumption we're driving more consumption so uh, and I, I touched on that a little bit in in um uh in the call i mean the last not the last sales but when i was in a different company the sales ops person i had I worked with this very closely because what we found out that actually that the training that we were delivering was, he was able to tell me, look, it's super high effort in terms of hours to prepare and deliver, but it doesn't correlate to any meaningful movement in usage. And so we, that, just that insight alone from an ops person was enough to go, we have to completely rethink training. So what did we do? We built a bot, we automated it, built it into the product and told customers we'll come and train you but you have to go through the online bot training first and then we found the needle moved quite dramatically That's really so correlation i think is one thing i would definitely be looking uh, for an ops person to help me with what's working well what should we double down on doing more of what is ineffective that we may need to stop doing or, or that we need to uh rethink uh how we're doing it uh, and i think the other thing uh from an ops perspective is, is again um 
helping to understand uh, what the sales forecast looks like and how that failed sales forecast might translate into paying customers. And then how do we need to think about staffing up the organization and allocating people, either net new people or allocating people to different segments of customers based on what the forecasting looks like. Cool. Yeah. Um, really good. So um, questions just keep coming in. So, so this is really good. So, so if you, if, as you have them, keep popping them in. Um, Stephanie asked a question here. Looks like I'm going to read through this one. Looks like you got a lot of content here. So I'm, I'm going to go through it. And if I, if I'm going to get my pen, I'll take some notes. <laughs> <laughs> so she says, first of all, she says, look, this is a great. This is a, an excellent framework. Thank you for them. She says as an earlier stage startup, we've had many starts and stops with engaging other departments, maybe marketing products specifically, mm -hmm. um, where they're interested and meet with customers and then get busy with other initiatives and their engagement mm -hmm. falls off the table. We're left without things like a comprehensive approach for ease of product use and marketing positioning for the customer success, customer suction we manage. Yeah. Um, we then look at ourselves to figure out how to plug these gaps and we feel the pain immediately. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that experience. So almost more like a, an alignment. It's like yeah, yeah. On their stuff, marketing's working off on their stuff. Mm -hmm. And what, what oftentimes happens is you, you had the point in your slides of sometimes customer success is just kind of the catch all. Um, yeah. I've heard other people say it as customer success is kind of like at the end of the river, like all the other stuff that everybody else does kind mm. of ends up over here. And so, yeah, if, if they're, if they're not aligned, if they're kind of all over the place, you know, we're the ones who are, are, are kind of the last, we're, we're at the end of the river in a lot of cases, but. Uh, yeah. I think another way to think about that is that um, all of the gaps or all of the problems upstream manifest themselves downstream. So you That's just, you, yeah, yeah. You just spot them. That's right. So I think, I mean, it's a great question and I can't profess to have an exact answer for it, but from the description, it sounds like much more of an organizational cultural challenge rather than and an alignment challenge uh, rather than necessarily um, anything specific to what you guys are doing. So as a CS team, your natural instinct is to help and your natural instinct is to make do, right? Okay, there is a gap here. And I think what I would be inclined to do is to pick your battles about which gaps that you are going to fill. So if you um, do the, you know, do the quote right thing, go, well, there's a gap here in how we do this product positioning, so we'll build that ourselves and solicit that with customers. Now, in the short term, that's the right thing to do, but in the long term, you're masking the core problem. And if you're masking the core problem, it will never get fixed, right? So uh, no one will know that having a hard handover is a problem if you never put your head above the parapet and say, hey, this is an issue. You know, 59% of the customers, we have to resell the value, right? If you're just quiet about it or try to solve it, you won't fix the root problem. So what I've been trying to do is those downstream things that are missing, pick your battles very judiciously about what you will fill the gap for and what you won't. Uh, and then what you won't, um, and even though it may cause some pain, is that's what you want to push upstairs to your leadership and have them solve that at the leadership level. Because the classic executive leadership refrain is, if somebody had told me this was a problem, we would have done something about it. <laughs> Right uh, now, the other variable which is harder to quantify is sometimes it can just be the personalities of people involved in certain parts of the business. Right? Some people, you know, they, they don't think in broader terms, or they, they you know, they, they like to work in a more isolated fashion. Uh, that again is a is a whole other challenge, which is a combination of both upward and downward uh, uh, pressure to to resolve. But I think if certainly from a Things that you're filling the gaps on, I would just advise be a bit more judicious about what you do and what you don't, and then surface up the things that you're not filling that are a problem. Yeah, and if you're higher up in the organization, that's you know, it's no mystery. You've got to really focus on driving alignment across all of your various different teams to make sure that everybody's rowing in the same direction. If you've got product going this direction, mm -hmm. you know, building for this market, and you got marketing over here talking in this direction. And they're, you know, bringing in customers that don't fit the product market that product is building for and customer success is at the end of this. Um, in a lot of cases, like you say, it's, you know, not necessarily something that customer success or any one department can necessarily solve, but they can raise questions and they can raise, you know, issues further up the org and say, it feels like we're out of alignment on this topic. 
Um, should we should we get together and talk about it and adjust our initiatives, adjust our exactly study and OKRs recently? And you know, there's a lot of you know good best practice around driving alignment through an entire organization by having really clear exactly key results. And in a similar way too, when we're talking about working with product, what you want to be feeding back up up the chain is not complaints but problem statements. Yeah. So because X is missing, the team is having to spend five hours a week doing Y which detracts us from our core mission, there's a gap here. You know, that, that's, if you want to kind of present it that way, I think. Got it. Cool. Um, Sharath asked this question. So in a SaaS product company with only one CSM and around 30 to 50 customers, so startup company, what should be the touch points with each customer apart from just renewals and support? What should be the frequency of touching base with the customer? Um, probably there's a bunch of context here, but hmm. maybe instead of, saying here's exactly what they would be maybe think of it as like what are the questions that you would try to answer like you know well it's a really it's a great question and the standard answer would be well what kind of money do they pay you split them up by money these people who pay you the most get the most blah 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 now you could take that approach but i would actually be inclined to think about something a little bit out of the box which is if you have uh, one person and 50 customers a lot of really top, great knowledge lives with your CSM, but a lot of really great knowledge lives with those customers. What can you actually do to encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning? How can you get your customers to help each other? And that could be as simple as actually, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to enroll you in an online community or we're going to put you into a private Slack channel, a shared Slack channel, okay. and I'm going to run every week some kind of knowledge sharing topic or bring in a speaker or whatever. So you're generating an actual community of engagement. And then what you're doing as a CS person is you, you may be not necessarily directly answering questions posed to you in there, you may be directing them to other customers who have the answer and are willing to share it. And so what you're actually trying to do is to manage these customers at scale through a community type approach. Uh, and still obviously do the higher touch things like reviews and check-ins, but make that like a key vehicle by which you are engaging all of them. But really what you're trying to do is get them to engage each other. Yeah, I think that most of the most of the SaaS companies or any software company that I enjoy working with, it's not because they don't ever, you know, have issues, but they give me the ways to to find and solve my problems. If I'm having an issue with Slack or if I'm having an issue with it, nine times out of ten, I Google it and I find some user forum where some exactly, other yeah. customer answers my question. So yeah, um, no, I'm I'm totally with you on that. So. Well, this is this is fantastic. We've got through. I think mo most of the questions. I'll, I'll do a quick skim through. I think we've got through those. Um, one call to action that I'm going to give to everyone, and I've already gotten a few. Funnily enough, my own CS team is actually on the session, and I've already got a couple of them sending me their elevator pitch. Oh, great! Okay. I, I, I would love to hear elevator pitches from other CS teams. So send them over to us. You can send them to me, Market Client Success, or Rob at, is it crane.vc? Is that- see, Yeah, 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 that's the best way to get hold of me, yeah. That would be cool to see the different kind of elevator pitches out there. So if you if you have something that you're thinking about, feel free to send it over. I, I, yeah, I and remember the key, put together. the key thing in doing that is to make sure you're defining the value you add, nobody else is defining it for you. That's the key thing. Because otherwise you'll end up owning a bunch of stuff nobody wants to own or that doesn't fit anywhere else. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Well, cool. No, th th this has been great. Really appreciate you taking the time, Rob. And My pleasure. Any, any last things, any last calls to action, any last piece of advice that, that you want to share before we wrap it up? Yeah. Well, look, I think, as I say, I think just to reiterate the general theme of the session today is it's a very unusual time. I think it will result in quite a lot of change in the business landscape. And it is definitely time to uh, really think about the, uh, and not be shy about kind of promoting the value that you're adding because the understanding now that existing customers are actually foundational to how we are, thrive, how we're gonna thrive as a business is every day by day becoming more and more uh, understood. But I think the purpose of today's session was if you can take a bit more of a structured approach and do some of these things, you'll really help accelerate that understanding a lot better and, uh, and, and, you know, sort of make your lives better, make your customers lives better, but also ultimately help, help your business. Um, so, and then just finally, I think the key message is, you know, this idea of 
try not to think in terms of sales and post sales. You know, it's sales and next sale. It's a continuous sales motion. If you think that way and you can inculcate that thinking into the rest of the organization, you'll find that alignment hopefully starts to get a little bit easier because everybody is thinking uh, much more longer term by virtue of, yeah, we sold them this deal, but how are we going to sell them the next one? Uh, and that's going to align much more with the kind of work that you do. Awesome. Rav, you were great. Really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. Just so everybody knows, we will we'll take the recording. We're going to post it onto our website. I'll send out the link. But if you go to clientsuccess.com slash webinars, I hope later today, my time, I get it up. If not, it'll be tomorrow. Um, I'll post the slides. And so, yeah, again, we, we would love to hear from everybody. Um, if you've got an elevator pitch, feel free to, to send that over. We'd love to, to see what everybody's working on. But um, we'll let everybody get back to it. And really, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It was fun. I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, agreed. Next time in person, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Take care, everybody, and stay safe. All right. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye bye.